Okay, well, welcome, Chris Harvey, to the Romford Film Festival. You. Although you're a bit of an old hand and you've been here before, but welcome nonetheless. Um, uh, what an astonishing short film. I've really, really enjoyed it. So it's all set on the day of the King's coronation. Yes. So talk me through how you, how did the premise of these films come to you? Because now I saw last year you had a film set on the day of the Queen's death. I'm noticing a bit of a regal theme going on in your work. So are you deliberately hunting out royal stories? What's going on? Uh, well, because I often in my job cover sort of royal events, and those were like the most major royal events I think in our lifetimes. Uh, I mean, the great thing is that with what I do, I shoot lots and lots of footage, and I suddenly realised out of this footage I could actually make some really interesting documentaries from my perspective because you get the t what I would call the TV perspective where everything is sanitised. Everyone's in great camera positions. You've got huge teams of presenters, huge banks of cameras, and there's just me with my mobile phone there on the ground. In it, I, it's almost like being in the trenches in a way. Absolutely, and it's great to get that perspective of you know someone who was actually there on the ground on that historic day, as you say. Um, so what is your day job? Talk us through that. You're a press photographer. Yeah, press photographer stroke sort of paparazzi. I don't mind people calling me a paparazzi because that's what I do, but also press photographer also works well. And I think it, it probably in the future, those films that you've made, oh, right, there we are, um, they're going to be great sort of archival footage and great stock footage. You could end up selling it for quite a lot of money to some prestigious university in the future. Oh yeah, I mean there's there's things that I actually want to get into sort of one of the archives. So one of the projects I did, which I will be working on in the future as well, is my video of the laying in state queue. So I followed oh, the it. Queue. Yes, oh, my yes. Goodness. So I literally got out at Bermondsey and I filmed it all the way as far as I could go. So because I wasn't officially part of the queue. I was just following everyone because I thought I want to get that perspective so I've got that whole thing on record and I think it's about a three or four hour bit of footage which yeah. obviously I mean, you wouldn't put into a festival because it would just bore people to tears. But I don't know, I think that's, that's an experimental <laughs> film. I can imagine Lars von Trier releasing his tape of, of the queue. Um, <laughs> So talk me through your process. Is it that you're just sitting at home and then do you wait for a big event to happen and then you think, right, let me get my camera and get out there? Or is there an element of planning? I guess it's hard to plan because you're waiting for a big event. Well, I mean, for so this film and the film I did so previously, there was, in a sense, no planning that that was eventually going to become a sort of documentary. That was just me doing literally doing my day job and looking for interesting footage which I could then sort of send out to the different news agencies. Uh, but then I realised that what I had could actually make a, a movie because I'd shot so many hours worth of footage. Like what you see there is just the tip of the iceberg from what I shot, although most of it was just boring being stuck in the rain <laughs> most of the time. But that, that was it. You, you just keep the camera running. You, you, if you catch something, you catch something. If you don't, you don't. Do you see yourself primarily as a documentary filmmaker? Like, in the future, do you imagine yourself ever doing like a narrative drama with a script? Do you see yourself going in that direction? Or do you think you're always going to be a doc documentary type, type of person? Well, I must admit, when I... I always thought that I would be more of a sort of a sci-fi short filmmaker or horror sort of filmmaker, but I kind of fell into the documentary making, and I actually really get a lot out of the documentary making because I feel again I'm capturing something. Because I think everything, I mean, what you have there are massive, massive stories, but yeah. everyone has a story in them. You know, everyone is interesting in their own right. You know, and I, I, I think that's the beauty of documentaries. You can take something really, really obscure and make it really, really interesting. So, for example, we had here yesterday the video, uh, the film Kim's video, 
about a, a video shop in America where all the tapes have been sent off to Italy. And yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah and that, that was absolutely crazy, but that's the type of, that's the beauty of documentary making. It gets stories that would often be hidden or often forgotten about, and it exposes them, and it, it allows us all to share in them. Now, I believe that you're at the moment working on a film about uh, an older gentleman living in Soho. So you do interview people that are not, it's not always royal subjects, is it? You are interested in other stories as well. Yeah, yeah. so uh, this guy I met uh, at a screening of a film called Sparrows Can't Sing. And he came up to me and he li literally, because I just got chatting with him, because he was a very unusual character. So basically he'd lived in the East End all his life. And he had three other friends and he basically said to me, he said, look, all my friends have like literally died. I want my knowledge to be saved. So I thought, you know what, that's an amazing project and what an honor it was to actually have the access to this guy. So that'll be the first thing I'll be doing after this documentary, because I know he hasn't got a lot of time left. So for me, getting his, getting his history of the area is so important and getting his friends interacting with him and telling us about him to paint his life in an interesting way. That, that'll be fascinating. I bet he's seen so much because the character of Soho has changed so much over the last... Oh, oh yeah, last uh, yeah I mean, years. it's like things have changed. Yeah, as you say, yeah, things have changed so much. So he's got a lot of history to tell. So I'm looking forward to telling that story. So hopefully next year that will be... That's what we have to look forward to. <laughs> Um, does anyone else want to speak to Chris, just to give you the opportunity, so it's not yes. just me? I've got a question. Oh, here we go. Chris, how do you deal, you know, in, in all of your films, it requires a lot of waiting around. Mm. How do you deal with that? You know, like, even in your, your, you know, your daily photography job, so to speak, do you spend a lot of time waiting? It's... Is, there, is there a knack to fill the time void? Uh... Well, it's very interesting. So my methodology there, because I was, I knew that I wouldn't be able to move anywhere for hours and hours and hours. The first thing was, don't drink a lot of water, oh. which I know is, which is why I ended up with a headache. Because if I drink, then I need the loo, yeah. and of course, in those situations, there's not always like bathrooms around, uh, and so I almost have to almost go on a fast in many ways. I have to just cut things out and just really endure and that can be really taxing on the body. Uh, so thankfully those things don't happen too much because if that was happening every day, I wouldn't do the job I was in basically because I, I, I'd be wasted by now. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it is a lot of endurance. Like the other day, uh, about actually two weeks ago, I was waiting to photograph Tom Holland coming out of the theatre during rehearsals. I waited nine hours and I saw him for a total of three seconds. So you've got to be ready with the camera for that three seconds to get that shot. Exactly, because if I had like gone off to the loo, I mean, I always remember one sort of Pat telling me that he waited for five hours for Kate Moss uh, to come out of a club. And he got to the point where he was so desperate to go to the loo, he thought, right, I've got to go. So he went behind some bins. And that was the moment that Kate Moss uh, decided to walk past him and kind of laughed as he was sitting there, well, standing there with his bits out. Because so. <laughs> she knew she could get right past him without any photos being done at all. Now, going off that question, how do you deal with the public? Because it strikes me that in all these filming situations that you're in, you have no real control, there's kind of people walking everywhere, um, and you know, people, <coughs> sorry, people may or may not want to be filmed, some people I'm guessing are probably quite rude to you, I would, you know, that's what yeah. the public's like, so like, it, are you kind of depending on their goodwill, are you, how do you deal with all these people that you can't control, it's not like a film set where yeah. it's a controlled space. I mean, as you can see sort of there, there was, I mean, for that whole day I didn't get any aggression, but it was just more annoyance of people with umbrellas and flags and everything. Like you set, you set up like what you hope is gonna be a good shot 
and then suddenly just a whole multitude of umbrellas just gets in the way. So when I was trying to do the Royals on the balcony, you could hear there people saying, get the umbrella down, get the umbrella down. Because, but it was so wet at the same time, so you can understand why people have the umbrellas up. But at the same time, you're like, I just wish I could just like jank them out their hands and just destroy them. Uh, but I do get, in, in my day-to-day -day job, I do sometimes get like a lot of aggression. But it's often just members of the public. It's very rarely the celebrities. I mean, I think one of the worst ones I ever had was when I was down Brick Lane and a guy deliberately tried to push me in front of the car. So that was quite uh, a shock, uh, to say the least. I also had someone in Soho uh, literally, again, just try and just kick me because he thought he was defending a celebrity, which was so ridiculous because this person wanted to be photographed. They were in the Helps dress. Helps their career. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Paper. And, that, and so, the, and you get a lot of people who think just because I'm a photographer and a paparazzi that that equals you're a bad person. Yeah. But they don't realise that actually, yeah, you've got a lot of celebrities who want to be seen. You're they a don't necessary part of that ecosystem. Exactly. They don't put on the fancy dress and like try and look amazing when they're coming out of the place just to not be photographed. And yeah, this guy just went sort of way too far. Well, I want to say that I really admire you because it sounds like you kind of endure and put up with a lot to get your films made. Sounds like a lot of standing outside in the rain and the cold, in all weathers, trying not to go to the toilet, dealing with rude people. So I really admire that commitment and tenacity that you have. Um, just to sort of draw things to a close, uh, plans for the future. What are you hoping to achieve over the coming years with your filmmaking journey? Well, I have literally, I'm hoping by this time next year, I should have six documentaries filmed with it within the next year so they're all sort of very very different subjects so I'm shooting something with a guy called David Lieberhart uh, who's known in America for the junior Christian science bible lesson he's a very interesting guy I shall say but amazingly bonkers and what I found really interesting with him is when I was speaking to him I thought he was just making up loads of nonsense like he was claiming that he knew Jim Henson and Doris Day and quite a few other celebrities and I thought nah he, he doesn't know them and he kept on saying oh yeah I met them at church I met them at church and then I looked at the people who actually attended his church and sure enough <laughs> Jim Henson, Doris Day and everyone else he mentioned but sometimes with him it's hard to tell what is real and what is fake, or I should say what is delusion, because uh, he does also believe he's been abducted by aliens many, many times. So it's, <laughs> but he makes for an interesting subject. And yeah, I've got all the documentaries I'm doing are either going to be very interesting people or they're going to be sort of quite hard hitting. So I'm going to be also doing something with war veterans at the Stoll Mansions in Chelsea. And there's going to be a bit of a grimy story there, but I can't say too much about that yet. Well, that all sounds absolutely fascinating. And on behalf of all of us here at Romford Film Festival, we wish you the best of luck with all of those films. And yeah, I look forward to seeing six of them at next year's festival. <laughs> Chris Harvey! Woo!